And this equals f. Is the camera doing okay? Okay. This equals f of x n minus f of x zero. It does still say it's recording, right? Yeah. It did get bumped. Yeah. It's writing another test. <coughs> did it stop for a second? Okay. Well, we're going. And that's f of d minus f of c. Because xn equals d and x0 equals c. So it doesn't matter what the partition is. The summation gives you the exact same thing. So this, this set that we're taking to the soup of just has one number in it. So the soup is that one number. So for monotone functions, this complicated definition is actually trivial. Uh, the next easiest kind of function to think about calculating the variation for is one that's not necessarily monotone, but has a, um, well, I guess Halif has uh, a nice discontinuities, maybe just jump discontinuities, and also is only got finitely many oscillations if it oscillates up and down, like any polynomial or a, a, even a trig function over a finite domain. Except for the decreasing, it, so the decreasing would be f of c minus f of d. Right, yeah, the orders. Say you have a function whose graph looks like this. You can break it up into monotone pieces. So any function where you can break up the graph into pieces that are monotone. First piece is monotone increasing. The second piece is monotone decreasing. The third piece is monotone increasing. The fourth piece is monotone decreasing. The last piece here is monotone increasing. It turns out the variation of this function over this entire interval is the sum of the variations over the pieces. So I'm sure I get names of these things. Let's call this x1, x2, x3, and x4. The variation of this function over this interval, of course, of course, this takes proof that you can do this, is it's monotone increasing over the first interval, so I can go f of x1 minus f of c. It's, my, it's monotone decreasing over the next interval, so to, I could use absolute values, or I could do f of x1 minus f of x2. Make sure I get a positive quantity there. vertical distance between these two points. Then over the next one, it's monotone increasing. I could do f of x3 minus f of x2. Then it's monotone decreasing over the next one. The higher value is f of x3. So I can do f of x3 minus f of x4. And then over the last interval, it's increasing. So I can do f of d minus f of x4. And this could be simplified a, big, a little bit, combining white terms, but it's not a big deal. The more important thing here is you notice the pattern. Here it's monotone increasing. You take the high value minus the low value, take the variation over this piece. Monotone decreasing here, take the high value minus the low value to get the variation over that piece, etc. Then you, you can add the variations over each piece up together to get the answer. Again, this would take proof. I'm skipping the proofs. The book doesn't skip the proofs. And these proofs in the last section of chapter three are pretty challenging. I think it's worth the effort, though, to do your best to understand them, because it's going to help prep you for chapter five, where you'll get proofs like that on your homework, to some degree. Proofs that are almost similar in difficulty. So this is a good warm-up for chapter five, okay? I'm focused on a factual approach, definition, some facts to know. You should study the, the book's proofs. All right, to finish class today, 
We're going to start chapter 4 on derivatives. Let's do a basic derivative calculation, like you'd get in Calc 1 even, except I want to do it in two ways to show you that both ways give you the same answer. <coughs> well, let's keep it pretty simple. Let's let f of x equal x squared. Let's find f prime of x. Don't just say the answer is 2x. Not allowed yet. Not allowed. <coughs> In Calc 1, here's how we teach people to do it. Take the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. Right? If you're a math lab, you sometimes help people with this kind of thing, I hope. You should carry the limit sign along. Hopefully you don't make the same kind of mistakes that people in Calc 1 make. You know, a common mistake is they don't, they don't understand what to do with that symbol there. They think it's like x squared plus h squared sometimes. But no, you have to square the entire binomial there, x plus h quantity squared, so you need to foil it out. But future teachers, that is a common mistake if you haven't noticed already by being in math labs. People don't know what to do with this thing. Or they think, they think they're supposed to multiply the f through here when they say it's f of x plus f of h or something. No. The x squareds cancel. With what's left on top, the h can be factored out. And divide it out with the one on the bottom, which is okay to do because thinking of x is fixed here, thinking of this as a function of h, technically it's undefined at h equals 0. However, the value of the limit is independent of what happens at h equals 0. So if I cancel it, it's okay. It'll still be the same limit if the limit exists. What's left over is a continuous function of h that can now be evaluated with the limit by plugging in h equals 0 to say your answer is 2x. I want you to be able to do this limit calculation another way that the book talks about. Let's open it up here. Another equivalent way to do it gets you the same answer, but the algebra is a little different. The limit as v approaches x, I think is the notation the book uses. I might be off there. Of f of x minus f of v, or well, let's see, I've got to get the direction right. f of v minus f of x over v minus x. Actually, if I put an x there and a v there, I could also put an x there and a v there and still get the same thing. These are the same. You can relate these things. They will give you the same thing. Essentially, v minus x is like your h over in the first approach. The x is here, v is there v minus x, the distance between them is like the h. But the algebra is a little different here. Instead of um, expanding and canceling, you've got a factor at the top. As a function of v for fixed x, this is continuous everywhere except when v equals x. But since the value of the limit is independent of what happens when v equals x, I can do that cancellation there. Now plug in v equals x to get 2x. So I want you to learn this other way of doing it too, to be flexible. Today we focused on a calculation. Wednesday we'll get into the theory, okay, and do some 
proofs or sketches of proofs at least. All right, have a good day.